returning to what is precious in us and precious in nature. The earth is not only our physical home base, but it's also a sacred creation designed by God, just as we have been. Just as we have been given worth and value and holiness, so too has our earth. And just as, have we, just as we have been gifted with understanding and wisdom and love and beauty and intelligence, so has our earth. And we can listen in to the sounds of nature and be guided and healed because the nature of nature is God. What might we learn about life and living from listening to and returning to what is precious, not only in us, but in nature? Wendell Berry spoke the truth when he wrote, The earth is what we all have in common. And Lady Bird Johnson expressed it in this way. She said, the environment is where we all meet, where we all have a mutual interest. It is the one thing of all that we share. Leo Tolstoy expressed that one of the conditions of happiness is that the link between man and nature shall not be broken. Primatologist Jane Goodall wrote, I truly be believe that only when the head and the heart work in harmony, and we regain our spiritual connection with our inner selves and with Mother Nature, can we achieve our true human potential. Like music and art, expressed former President Jimmy Carter, love of nature is a common language that can transcend political and social boundaries. And I especially applaud this understanding by Rachel Carson, who wrote, the more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and the realities of the universe about us, the less taste we shall have for destruction. Sadly, it seems that ever since God created us, as told in the first chapter of Genesis, and then in verse 28, God tells humanity to subdue the earth and to have dominion over the animals. We, I believe, had gotten this a little bit crooked just on what subduing and dominion really mean. Tim Mackey and Jonathan Collins, who wrote, uh, excuse me, founders of a program called The Bible Project, uh, explained that the word subdue has been twisted in modern times to justify our pillaging of the Earth's resources with abandon when rather the subduing of the earth was meant as an agricultural expression, referring to the work that we do to contribute to God's creative project here on earth by cultivating the soil, by planting seeds, gardening, and other forms of agriculture. The subduing is meant in the way in which one might subdue a plot of land. Planting seeds, watering it, cultivating it, caring for it, and harvesting its fruit. We are called to subdue the world in this way, as in the planting of seeds. Now, these seeds can not only be physical seeds which turn into vegetables and trees, but also the seeds of our thoughts, our beliefs, our attitudes. We are to subdue the world as in cultivating our gifts planting and building up the earth, planting and building up each other, working for the common good and sharing our fruit with others, not dominating and destroying the earth. I'd like to share a real story with you about the healing power of nature, which I found in a 2019 edition of Guidepost magazine. The story is by Mark Speckhart from Short Hills, New Jersey. And it's about his own experience going through cancer treatment and the healing that he and others experienced by sharing the gifts of nature while sitting on a wooden bench overlooking the distant South Mountains at a place called Mabel's Bluff in New Jersey. Eight years earlier, Mark had just gotten back from an international business trip and he had a sore throat and it hurt to swallow. And there was also some kind of burning going on in his chest. But he just thought it would go away. 
When it didn't, he eventually saw his doctor, and he was told that he had stage 3 esophageal cancer. Mark wrote that the doctor was calm and reassuring, but his mind had already jumped to, to the end, the conclusion of his life. He thought, I'm just 42, and I'm done. Game over. The world closed in over him. His life was focused on himself and the word cancer. He went to his wife, Danielle, and their three children feeling completely defeated. But Danielle kept telling him, you'll get through this, we will get through this, and you can't give up. Here is how Mark tells his story in his own way. He wrote, I felt that it was too late for me, even with my loved ones nearby. I felt so alone. I paced back and forth behind our house, barely aware of everyone and everything around me, the trees, the birds singing, my two Weimaraners, Mabel and Pearl, didn't know whether to follow me or to keep their distance from me, Mark wrote. I'm a doer. I'm curious by nature. Woodworking and hiking the trail system behind my house, these are two of my passions. But it felt as if I was already shutting down. My oncologist prescribed a protocol of 11 chemo treatments spread over 14 weeks with radiation five days a week for nearly half that time and eventually surgery. The doctor said there was a good chance that the burns and blisters from the radiation treatment would make swallowing more painful. Mark said, to be honest, I dreaded everything about it. If it weren't for my family, I might not have even bothered with the treatment. In the first radiant treatment, I lay uncomfortably on a table inside a body cast to ensure that I didn't move. Like a mummy, I thought. Already dead. The technician dimmed the lights and began, Breathe in. One, two, three. Breathe out. One, two, three. I had practiced meditation for years, and now I focused on the voice of the technician, letting it lead me to breathe. There was something unexpectedly soothing about, about this experience. And for the first time, I relaxed. I let go. Mark said his mother had given him a bottle of holy water from Lourdes, France. And he said, I dabbed it on my fingers and make the sign of the cross over myself after the treatment was over. Something awakened inside of me, Mark wrote. He said, I added homeopathic treatments and fresh made juices to my regimen. In my meditation se sessions, I felt at peace, and I had never experienced a single side effect from the radiation. And the doctor told me to exercise as much as possible to build up my strength for my recovery. There were six weeks between my final treatment and surgery, so I returned, hiking to, returned home and began hiking the woods behind my house, a 21-acre nature reserve. Pearl and Mabel, my doe dogs, went with me. I soaked up the beauty of the forest, the rustling of the leaves, the birds flitting about and singing, and my fear began to fade. The day of surgery, Danielle went with me to the hospital, saying, stay strong now, you're almost there. Surgery took nine hours and another ten days of recovery. Danielle couldn't be with me every minute, so I began imagining what I would do when I got home. My family hiking with the family and my dogs. One day, a thought stormed into my mind, build a bench. You know, I loved woodworking. Danielle had a cedar chest and a coffee table that I'd made, plus some arty shelving for plants and her knickknacks. I'd made a picket fence, and on every piece, I wrote a memory made somewhere on them. Lying in the hospital bed, I imagined what the design of my new bench might, might be. It made the time go faster. 
You know, I think Mark's ability to use his imagination to think of things that were pleasant for him, things that he loved doing, things that he planned on doing in the future, enable him to move his consciousness from the worry, anxiety, and the fear of the present diagnosis and treatment that he was undergoing. He said, I imagined the bench in the style of a church pew, solid, expansive. I thought of it as a place for unwinding, a place for reflection and meditation. I started on the bench a few months after I got home. I cut the pieces for the back and seat. I sanded the wood until it was smooth. I measured and cut the back supports, then notched and cut the base. I was only strong enough to do a little each day, but there was healing in the work. At last I was done, and I inscribed a memory made on the back. Danielle loved it, and so did the kids. I placed it in our yard under a favorite tree, but somehow it didn't seem like the right location. The bench seemed destined for something more, he said. He wrote, one day, while out walking Pearl and Mabel, I found a new trail that I'd never explored before, and I named this path Pearlie's Path. After a short walk on this trail, we came to a small clearing overlooking a bluff. The ravine was deep. The round was rocky. Far below, I can see the road which weaved through the, re the, excuse me, the, re the reserve. And beyond that, I saw a stream which fed a pond. Mark continued, the canopy extended out like a green ocean to the mountains. It was breathtaking. I stood there for the longest time, not wanting to lose the moment, and I decided to call this area Mabel's Bluff. As soon as I was strong enough, I dragged the new bench down there. I sat for nearly an hour, my own private sanctuary. In the weeks that followed, I added birdhouses that I'd made, and handcrafted chairs and a wind chime. I closed my eyes, and I'd let my mind go quiet. I listened to nature around me. I felt the breeze. I thought of the day when I received my diagnosis, when I felt so alone. So much had changed since then. It was weird. Even though I was all alone there in Mabel's Bluff, I felt a deep connection to the world, to the universe, and to God. On Sunday morning, I took a walk to Mabel's Bluff. And I was surprised to see a group of cyclists enjoying cold drinks, their bikes propped up against nearby trees. We love it here, said one of them. We stop by every week. You know, I'd never thought of anyone else appreciating Mabel's Bluff the way that I did. But I like the idea of it being a shared experience. That chance meeting sparked another idea. I built a wooden box with a lid on it, and I left a composition book and a pen inside. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite spots I wrote on that first page, and I'd love to hear what it means to you. A week later, I read the first entry that someone had made, written in beautiful script. It read, I'm weeping tears of joy and gratitude. I asked the universe to cheer my low spirits today, and look what I discovered this place and this book. And below that, another person had written, it is sad and comforting at the same time to know that the people who come here have struggles and problems and they hurt, but this place can make those things disappear for a moment. I know because it does that for me. Mark wrote that some of his favorite entries which have been left in the book, in the box on the bench, were written in response to other people's entries, offering comfort and understanding. One person wrote, I'm crying every day and wanting to give up, but for some reason I keep trying. Stupid, I know. At least I have this place to come to, to get away from it all. The next entry from someone read, You sound like a great person. You got this. Still another person wrote, You are not stupid, you are a soldier. 
Have faith in yourself. We all have greatness inside us. And Mark wrote, I wanted to see if the original writer would apply, reply. And a few days later, this person did. And they wrote, thank you so much. You have no idea how much this means to me. Mark wrote in his article that all of us are part of a kind of community, facing different life, cha life challenges, but united by an appreciation and wonder of God's creation. He said, my hand lightly caressed the bench, feeling the strength of the wood. But you know, it no longer felt like my bench. Maybe it had never been. Mark shared that his life is fuller now, more than it ever had been. He makes time every week to go to Mabel's Bluff, a place where, he said, even if I'm by myself, I'm never truly alone. You know, there are so many ways that you and I can reclaim our conscious connection with others and with the earth. It is not complex. In fact, it's rather simple. Whether alone or with another, we can simply take a walk down the street or through a park. <clears throat> Being attentive to the birds singing, the wind blowing, and the greening up of the blossoms of spring flowers popping up and coloring our day. Enjoying the warmth of the sunlight on our skin, the light breeze that kisses our cheek, the soft path we walk, strewn with tall grass ripe for the mower. I saw a t-shirt, a slogan that uh, spoke about some of the restrictions we've felt during the pandemic. It read, when you can't hug a person, hug a tree. Really, this is a wonderful thing to do, even if others are looking at you like, you know, you're kind of crazy. I loved reading a Salina comic called, Salina Journal comic called, Rose is a Rose. The main character is a young wife and a mother of a young boy named Rose. Rose has a special tree that she calls her Let It Be tree. Whenever something worries her, causes her to be anxious or fearful, her husband and young son can find her out hugging the tree, her let it be tree, in their yard. Rose found that this tree ministered to her in a way that only nature can, allowing her to release her fears and anxieties. I remember one endearing scene in the comic, which took place in the wintertime. Rose was outside hugging her let it be tree, but the temperature had begun to drop outside. Her husband went out to her and placed a scarf around her neck and a hat on her head, and then he let Rose be, and quietly just returned to, their, to the warmth of their home. I love placing my hands on my little Japanese maple tree just at the end of my patio in my backyard. And my prairie fire crabapple tree is gorgeous right now, blooming in the front yard. There's a book beautifully elucidating the spirituality of the earth and how we may consciously reconnect with it. The book is called Earth, Our Original Monastery, Cultivating Wonder and Gratitude Through Intimacy with Nature. And this book is by Christine Walters Paintner, P-A-I-N-T-N-E-R. Paintner's book is filled with poetry, with spiritual exercises, uh, exploring the world of nature, meditations, and reflective questions to ponder. And I will be using some of these ideas from her book later in our meditation time. But in this message, I'd like to share with you some of the ideas presented in Chapter 4, which is called Earth as the Original Spiritual Directors. Painter writes in this fourth chapter, We are called to live the life of the new creation in which right relationship to all creation is restored. We are not anticipating its rival sometime in the future, but we are living its becoming right now. The journey that we are on now is the journey home. The journey to no longer live in exile from our physicality, but to live 
the new creation in this moment which honors our bodies and the great body of the earth as essential vessels of wisdom. Nature, Paintner writes, has a way of offering us solace in times of need. This means that when our hearts feel heavy or conflicted, we can find healing by walking a trail in the woods, along a river, at the shoreline of a lake, or in a nearby park to experience a sense of kinship with creation. Remember, the nature of nature is God. In these moments, the natural world often meets us as a guide and offers insight or peace to us. When I read this passage, it reminded me that when I was attending Unity's ministerial school, in my second year, I moved on ground to the old hotel. And um, this had been turned into a women's dormitory with bedrooms upstairs, and on the ground floor was a, a piano and old comfy chairs. There were five other members of my class, ministerial class, living there at the time. Outside, there was a brick wall, a tall brick wall, surrounding the entrance of the hotel with a small uh, opening there. When things got too stressful for myself and my classmates, uh, due to the classes we were taking, to the things happening in our own lives, what we were discovering about ourselves, uh, our thoughts about and concerns about our future. My classmates and I, my buddies, would go outside and we'd climb up on this tall wall and we would howl at the moon or just howl together if the moon was invisible. Just being together out in nature, howling, such a natural thing, we hear the animals making all kinds of noise out in nature. And so there we were, howling getting all of that tension and worry and concern out in a very physical way. It was healing, as nature can be. Peytner writes that the fields, the sun, the mud, the clay, the wind, the forest, the earth, the sky, and water are all companions for us on our inner journey. The elements of water, wind, earth, and fire offer us wisdom and guidance. They are the original soul friends, she wrote. Air is the gift of breath that we receive each moment, the rhythm of life that sustains us. Fire is the gift of the life force and energy. Water is the gift of renewal and replenishment, refreshment. We, um, our blood, the blood that flows through us, is all a form of water. And most of our body is composed of water. Earth is the gift of groundedness and nourishment. The bread and the wine a communion. The act of eating is sacred and holy and sustains our life and our work on this planet. This is a lovely section that Painter adds. All created things wait to serve the divine purpose in our lives. Through every rock, every bird, every flower, and every creature, there is connection. God enters into intimate communion with us. This, writes Painter, is how God's wisdom is revealed to us through nature. When we practice watchfulness, and become aware of the wonder that surrounds us and the holy surprises which await us in each moment if only we pay attention to the nature of earth around us. As we listen to this nature, we are healed. Thank you so much. I hope that you had a wonderful Earth Day and realize that Earth Day is not just one day in the 365 days of a year. Earth Day is every day when we allow ourselves to be in touch with what surrounds us, the beauty, the joy, the quiet, the solitude, the healing properties of the nature within us and the nature around us getting in touch with what is precious in us and precious in nature 
is healing. God bless you.